The art and science of reading the Bible is called hermeneutics. The Bible has more than 1,100 chapters, over 31,000 verses, and greater than three quarters of a million words. Every time I read it, I trip over statements or even whole stories that I somehow missed before. So in trying to study something, a concordance is pretty much mandatory. And with the internet age, I can get search results at the push of a button. So seeing everything that the Bible has to say on a certain topic, noun, or verb is becoming far easier than ever before. Literal reading is reading the text as a fact. Abraham was a literal person who was literally going to sacrifice his son Isaac. This was not some sort of metaphor or parable. King David literally was a person who truly did send Uriah off to battle to get killed. His son literally was King Solomon. This is what a literal read of the Bible entails, reading it as a history book, as telling us a story. But the prophetic books have a vast array of symbols and meanings, sometimes explained immediately, sometimes borrowed from elsewhere in the Bible. Not everything can be read literally. The largest factor between literal and figurative is context. Does the author seem to indicate that the picture he is painting is presented as a contrast, and that did it literally occur? This is when we start thinking figuratively. But is this the only time? Let's explore principles that people have come up with and see how the Bible says to read itself. The first thing to note is that the Bible itself states repetition is key. In Isaiah 28.10 we read, Precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And in 2 Corinthians 13.1, 13, the second half reads, In the mouths of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. We actually see that all through the Old Testament as well. Two or three witnesses are required for just about everything. So this is the definition of the base of good hermeneutics. Let's contrast it with what is generally recognized as bad hermeneutics. One point of bad hermeneutics is bringing together unrelated passages. As this classic example, Matthew 27, 5 says, He, being Judas, went away and hanged himself. And then let's merge that with Luke 10, 37, the second half, that says, Go and do likewise. And then John 13, 27, the second half, which says, What you are about to do, go do quickly. This is like reading a geometry textbook and grabbing the formula for the volume of a sphere and trying to use it to calculate the perimeter of a square. It's just not going to work. Another common verse that gets misused is 2 Peter 3, 8. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. It often gets paired with the creation days to suggest that the earth is a lot older than the Bible would indicate, or it gets paired with a timeline of the Bible, like Bishop Usher's, which suggests the Earth is about 6,000 years old, taken to mean that we're on the verge of the millennium, which would be a thousand-year Sabbath. Even if it is factually true, it appears to be missing scriptural support. It needs more texts to back it up. After all, we have a lot of text. So good hermeneutics is bringing together related passages. Bad hermeneutics is also quoting out of context. Prosperity teachers will often cite the second half of Joshua 1.8. You will be prosperous and successful, without any regards to the context. They disregard the first half of the verse, which is the condition of the promise. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. So good hermeneutics is quoting in context. Bad hermeneutics is ignoring related passages. I recently went through a full study of Christian doctrine at a free online university. The majority of the doctrines expounded a lot of biblical references and text. I found it very enjoy enjoyable. However, when they talked about worshipping on Sunday, all of a sudden there were very few references to be had. And same for the concept of the soul. So good hermeneutics is gathering all the related passages. Bad hermeneutics is altering the translation. I'm not talking about grammar. The original Hebrew and Greek had no grammar, so scholars have to decide where to place periods, commas, etc. This can lead to funny situations such as Acts 19.12 where a comma was missed and Paul is healing sick handkerchiefs. I'm talking about bad hermeneutics, such as deciding that Jesus was not the deity and altering pa passages in support of that, like John 1.1 1, 1, which reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jehovah's Witnesses alter the end to read a God when the original Greek does not have the word a in the text. The Jehovah's Witnesses argue this point and then ask, well, why didn't John write the God if he meant Jesus was God? John couldn't have written the God because that would make Jesus the exact same being as the Father 
and scriptures testify that somehow they are separate beings but still one God. Good hermeneutics is ensuring that the translation is true to the underlying source text. Thus, Bibles that use italics to indicate words that have been added for clarity generally make better study Bibles. Bad hermeneutics is also improper use of language, like when some preachers break up atonement to be at one -ment. Atonement is an English word, and at one -ment has no bearing to the underlying text, or when they use Lazarus and the rich man to prove consciousness after death. Lazarus and the rich man is a parable and should be treated as such, not using it to prove an out-of-context doctrine that has little biblical support elsewhere. Good hermeneutics is proper use of language. Let the text speak for itself. Bad hermeneutics is redefining words or false meanings of words. One example is a study on the word forever. We use it in everyday life exactly like the Bible uses it. That lineup took forever. The pizza took forever to get here. It doesn't mean literally forever, but just the span of time until the end is reached. Collecting all the verses about forever demonstrates this. Another example might be taking the bear in Daniel 7 and suggesting that it must mean Russia because the Russian animal is the bear. When comparing it elsewhere in the Bible, you would see that it's Medo-Persia. So good hermeneutics is letting the Bible define its own words. One study might start numerous other studies to ensure that the meanings of the words are correct as the Bible defines them. Bad hermeneutics is limiting the meaning of a word or a phrase. The prosperity preachers like to take Romans 9, 22 and 23, which state, If God, choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction, what if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he had prepared in advance for glory, even us, whom he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles? They limit the riches of his glory to being the time spent on earth. Again, collecting all the verses that discuss the riches of his glory show a drastically different picture. Bad hermeneutics is ignoring who said it and what the Bible has to say about who said it. Additional context may actually force a negative. One example is in Job 22.9, where Eliaphaz the Temanite states, You, meaning Job, sent widows away empty-handed. So are we to assume that Job sent widows away empty-handed? Um, but we read in Job 1.8, God said, Have you not considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. The key to the contrast between these two verses is found in Job 42.7. He, being the Lord, said to Eliaphaz the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends, because you have not spoken of me what is right. So here we see that Eliaphaz the Temanite is actually being portrayed as a liar. So the fact that he says Job sent away widows empty-handed is in fact false. That did not happen. So good hermeneutics is looking at who said it and what was said about the speaker, the overall context. Bad hermeneutics is literalizing a figure of speech or parable. The Lazarus and rich man parable is often presented as a passage for proof of afterlife or hell. As well, at least one denomination believes that Christ was possessed by Satan on the cross based upon 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. But in reality, Christ was a lamb without blemish or defect, according to 1 Peter 1.19. Good hermeneutics is not ultra-literal. Bad hermeneutics allegorizes everything. These stories were not presented as parables, but as historical tales. Allegorizing them only harms scriptural integrity. Good hermeneutics does not allegorize everything. So, in summary, good hermeneutics maintains a balance between allegories and literals by the use of the whole Bible in its current context.